Well, everybody, it is April 20th, and the rebuild kit for the steel chainsaw has arrived. So I would say that it did come in a timely manner. Um, it went out, uh, actually, I'm not quite sure. Looks like April 17th was the actual ship date and it came out of came out of the sales department for bizlink llc pasadena freeway in pasadena texas huh so i'm wondering if this vo store that i bought from on ebay if they're using this company as some sort of a gateway or something to handle logistics here in the u.s because Vo stores, you know, definitely from the pricing and everything, probably a uh, Chinese supplier. So this is how it came in. So before I even open it up, I just tore that. But the bag's intact. But it, it, it looks like all they did was use the original packaging and throw it in one of these envelopes for priority mail. It says it was tracked and insured. Everything is just loosely packaged in there, so I'm kind of curious to see what kind of condition the stuff inside is going to be in. And can you imagine if, like, the inside of the cylinder was just left completely unprotected and, and say, like, the spark plug that came with this kit was allowed to just bang around during transit? Okay, so here's our box. Puncture there. Made in China. Oh, there's probably an original part number. I wonder if we Google that if something else comes up. 220-CY043. <laughs> All right, open this up. Well, that's good that the cylinder appears to be wrapped in its own plastic bag. Here's that funky air filter assembly. Here's the pull start handle. Man, that's got a, that's got a really cheap, cheap old plastic feel to it it doesn't have that more resilient rubbery feel that you have with uh with the better quality ones i can tell right away that's a different plastic here's our fuel line this must be the oil uh, these lines might be different not what i bought the kit for this is my bearings oh nice and quiet well, those bearings are certainly better shaped than what was uh, in here originally. Let's see if we could see any part numbers on these bearings. I could just make out a Ghost 2 on here. So there were numbers on these bearings. 6203s, I already know your secret. The only thing you're hiding from me is who really makes these bearings. I will say this, the cages look like they're metal in this bearing. Well, they definitely, the cages are metal in this bearing. As opposed to plastic like the original steel ones so they do feel good though here's my oil seals let's see what these are these have a number co141 they got some other numbers on here i do see a 17 so that'll be the 17 millimeters and i do see a 30 which will be the 30 millimeters and i see a five so these are 17 by 30 by five these are five millimeter seals these are going to be thicker than the original ones and this is why some of the people complained about these aftermarket kits and saying the seals were too big interestingly enough they're actually they're actually measuring out at around four point yeah just under five whereas the original steel ones the genuine steel ones were uh, 4.4 so these are going to be probably sitting just the slightest bit proud of the housing question is does that pose a problem no that's not going to pose any problem i doubt it we shall find out this little plastic nothing here screen thing this is just your your filter that goes on the end of your hose down inside your oil tank in case any crud gets in your oil tank it won't get sucked up there's your uh super el chizo fuel filter this is the wrist pin uh not wrist pin this is the uh this is the bearing for the connecting rod i do believe or is it or is this for the actual clutch hub 
I don't remember. And then you get a spark plug. You get the power. Yu Ju Zhuan Young. Y O U J U Z H U A N Y O N G. That's a mouthful. It's funny. This says German technology. What the, what the heck is German spark plug technology? Really? That's number one. Right there. Number one. GB slash T7825 87. That's quite the uh, handful. Mouthful there on the uh, part number for this thing, huh? Oh, it's got a more generic L7T looking number on the actual spark plug itself. WX. Mm. Oh, what a puff. Yeah, what do you want for... All right. So what I'm more concerned about is... Let's look at this piston and cylinder. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is where the money is on this kit. All right. This must be where the impulse line hooks on. Here's your exhaust port. <laughs> so the piston's just kind of in there loose so it can do that 50,000 times during its shipment from as the boat rocks coming from China. <laughs> and then the rings are jammed in here. There's the little wrist pin. There's the little circlips. Is our piston. Now, condition wise, it certainly is an improvement over what we had, right? <laughs> Here's our cylinder. And it looks and feels pretty darn good. I think we can work with that. Nice. All right, time for some reassembly. So, the first thing I needed to do was uh, clean up this bottom half of the crankcase, uh, get all of this red sealant that was on here off of here. So I got most of it, but I'm gonna use a small little dental pick tool to get just the little bits here that I missed. So I wanna clean out this groove. It's basically the sealant will fill that groove and spread out a little bit over it. And uh, that's all that's in there, there's no gasket. It almost looks like there should be a seal in there. But there was no seal in here when I took it apart. Now, I don't think this has ever been apart. I think this is actually factory. The other interesting thing is um, here in the uh, surfaces that the outer part of the seal actually sit, there was a little bit of R... Oh, well, I almost called it RTV. Whatever the sealant stuff is, there was a little bit of it in there. You can see a little bit right there. But I think that was just incidental that it spilt over. I don't think there's supposed to be any in this groove. Uh, the other thing I just noticed, which I do find a little troublesome, is that on this side, it looks like the seal could be pressed in after it's assembled, which is what I would expect. But on this side, there almost feels like there's a, a little lip there, a little ridge which would make you think that the seal is designed to sit in there and then during assembly it, when you put it together, it gets captured in there. Which, if that's the case, then I'm going to be worried about that seal being a tiny bit thicker than the original ones. Remember, the original ones were, what were they, 4.7 millimeter wide or 4.4, something like that, and the new ones are like 5? Uh, we'll have to test that out when we get to it. Uh, here's some more good news. Uh, the new bearing, when I go to put it on this side, it actually stops right there. And it it's actually a, it's a press fit, <laughs> which is good. Because I don't know if you recall, but in the last video I showed how when I took this all apart, that the bearing on this side just slid right off sloppily. 
when it's supposed to be a press, press fit. My concern was that the, uh, the crankshaft itself had been damaged, but apparently, since I'm able to push that on like that, things are hunky-dory. So I've got to take this bearing off, but before I even bother doing that, I'm going to uh, get this piston off. So to remove the piston, I've got to take out this little clip in there, and there's a little notch right here. So right here, there's a little notch that allows you to get a very small, sharp instrument behind the little clip. And then, so you don't, uh, you know, get it in the eyeball, pop that clip out. Now with that clip out, I should be able to slide the wrist pin right out. Now I, I, I've got a new wrist pin so I don't care about this old one so I'm just going to grab it with some pliers and yank it out nastily. And the piston comes off and we do have a little bearing in there. That must be what that bearing is that they supplied with the kit. In other words, this, this bearing came in the kit, and I actually wasn't sure whether or not this bearing belonged in this crank assembly or whether or not it actually was part of the... Um, there's a little bearing just like this on the uh, sprocket uh, on the hub assembly. But, nope, apparently it's for this. Okay. So let's unpack those piston rings. Now what's nice about this little two-stroke piston is unlike other uh, pistons and vehicles and other larger things where you actually have to worry about whether or not the rings are lined up correctly or whatever, uh, in this case here, we actually have these little tiny pins. There's one there and there's one there. And the pin is going to be right where the gap, the ring gap is, okay? So those pins are going to locate the rings for us and make sure that uh, they're not, uh, that you don't have the two end gaps on the rings overlapping each other or, or right over each other. You need them staggered. There's actually, the ring is full thickness, but at the very end there, it gets thinner. So there's actually a little round area right there. It's really tiny. And you might not notice it at first glance. So you want to make sure that that skinny, skinny part is facing down because that will go underneath. That little skinny part will reach underneath that pin. I don't have any fancy ring expander or anything for these things. I just basically stretch it over. And then we're going to get this one into the bottom first. I'm trying not to scratch the finish on this nice piston. All right, so I've got this installed correctly. So now if I compress this piston ring, you'll see those two ends will actually, when the two ends come together, they actually will form a half circle that fits right underneath where that pin is. I'm going to slip the new bearing in. All right, so I've got to uh, know which way this piston's gonna go in, because it does have to go in a certain way. And before I can do that, I've gotta know which way this crank is gonna go in. All right, and that is actually pretty easy to figure out. So if I look at the, uh, the head here, okay, this is clearly the intake where the carburetor boot goes, all right? So if the intake carburetor is on the back of the engine facing this way, so my handle's back here, okay? So my cutter bar and chain are over here. So if they're over here, then that means that this is the side that actually has the part of the crankshaft that comes out that drives the sprocket, okay? And so then this is going to be the side that actually has the flywheel, okay? So, I know this is the flywheel side, and it has this uh, impulse 
port here is over on the flywheel side. I know on the crankshaft, because I disassembled it, that this tapered shaft over here is the flywheel side. All right, so I know that this assembly has to go in here like this. All right. Oh, I almost forgot. I've still got this bear, the old bearing on here. Listen to the difference, the new and the old. Is the uh, new. Is the old. A lot looser. All right. So I got to get this bearing off of here. Which I might have to put a little bit of heat on that inner race to get that to come off. I'm going to just gently nothing there oops yeah I want to get that off to the side while I'm doing this yeah I don't want to run the risk of uh, damaging this crank so I think yeah I'm gonna have to heat that up so let me get this in the vise or a vice. So when I apply the heat, I want to try and apply the heat to this inner race right here, this inner part on the bearing and not try and uh, not get too much heat on the uh, shaft itself. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get this metal to expand, but this metal not to expand as fast. Now that little cage in there that holds the bearings in place, if that is pl plastic, it might end up being damaged by uh, by the heat. But we don't care about that because it's the old bearing. Yeah, that's plastic, all right. Ooh, does that stink? That was on there tight. I just used the scotch bright pad and clean that up. Let's see how the new bearing fits. If it's a uh, tight press fit, which it may very well be, then I may very well want to, yeah, it's probably gonna be a tight press fit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to warm this bearing up some, uh, nowhere near as much as I was heating up that, and I'm gonna cool this down. So I'm gonna throw this in the freezer for oh maybe just like uh, 15 or 20 minutes and then I'm gonna uh, warm this up a little bit I have a junk toast oven that I uh, toast to you can't speak I have a dilapidated junky toaster oven that I use for heating small items like this all right that's nice and cool socket there we go that's it all right so now I'm ready to install the piston and I talked about this uh, this arrow right here on the top of these two-stroke pistons the arrow indicates the direction of flow through the engine that's the easiest way to remember it um, so it's actually pointing towards the exhaust port the idea being that the uh, you know, the flow of the gases is uh, through the carburetor, in through the intake port, and then out through the exhaust port. And so, keeping that in mind, again, getting back to my crank, I know that this tapered shaft on this side, this is the flywheel side. So, this is the bar and chain side. So, Back here would be the rear of the chainsaw where the carburetor sits. So I want this piston to go on with the arrow facing that way. Pop that wrist pin in there. And now I'm going to want to install the two 
new retaining clips for the wrist pin. <laughs> yeah, and there's a high risk of this going flying, so kind of kind of keep your hand cupped around the area. Try and minimize the risk of it uh, disappearing. You little pain in the, you know what? <laughs> I think I got it. I'm guessing you don't want the gap in the ring uh, lined up with this little uh, cutout area over here. All right, so once I have the retainer on the one side installed, I can push down on the wrist pin as far as it'll go and that should just expose the uh, groove enough for the ring to snap into for the, on this side all right so far so good so now I'm going to attempt to, to install the piston and rings assembly into the cylinder and again my arrow is pointing this way this is the intake so I need the arrow to point that way so the arrow is pointing that way out because that's the exhaust port there we go now once I've got that started in the uh, in the bore I'm just gonna temporarily push this down so the reason why there's an arrow on the piston why the piston has a particular direction that it goes in is because of those gaps where the uh, rings are so if you look through the exhaust port right here you can actually see the rings and you can't see those little pins where the uh, ends of the rings are all right and you don't see them through the intake port either because the intake port is even though this is the side that they're on they're actually behind this area here and here because the intake ports a lot smaller so if you put the piston in backwards with the arrow facing towards the carburetor, pointing towards the carburetor or towards the intake, the problem then becomes that when you would rotate this down, you would actually see those little um, ends of the rings, those little tiny pins where the ends of the rings are. And what can happen is as it's passing this opening right here, that end of the ring can stick out and when the piston is going up and up or down in this area right here the actual edge of the ring can get caught on this port the opening of the port here on the edge and break the ring off and it could even destroy the piston in the process so very bad so all you need to remember is that the arrow always faces the arrow always points in the direction of the flow of the gases through the engine and then in case you weren't sure, you just basically look through the exhaust port here and make sure you don't see any ring gaps. All right, so I think the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this up out of here just a little bit and I'm gonna install the seals. That way I don't have to worry about having to press fit the seals in once the thing's put together. And the reason why I don't wanna deal with having to press fit is because there is a little bit of a lip here and I already test fit and even though the seals are five millimeter instead of 4.4 or 4.7 or whatever uh, they actually do seem to fit so I'm not worried about that these seals are a no-brainer as far as how they go in because there's a open side where you can actually see the spring seal uh, sorry the seal spring and this is the side that would face out
Next step is I need to put the bottom of the crankcase back on. So the bottom of the crankcase I've already cleaned up. And I know that this side with the two threaded holes here is the oil pump side. So I know that that's going to face this side here. So I know this has to go on this way. All right. But before I put this on, I have to seal these surfaces. Now, there is quite a discussion and debate. A lot of people have very strong opinions on what should be used as the proper sealant in this situation. And most of those people are wrong. <laughs> And uh, I don't know whether or not there is any definitive right answer. Well, maybe I guess the definitive right answer would be the steel suggested, you know, steel has their own special sealant part number. Um, but obviously that sealant's not made by steel. That sealant is made by another company for steel. So the million dollar question is, what is that actual sealant? Well, a lot of people have opinions on what they think that sealant is or they have opinions on what they can what can be used as an alternate sealant. The two most important things to consider about what sealant is going to be used here are A, we've got some fairly high temperature to deal with, um, and B, and this is the most critical thing, I believe, is that the sealant choice has to be a sealant that is impervious to gasoline. So, Unlike a crankcase in a car that has oil in it and the oil pan is sealed using regular RTV sealant because RTV sealant works in that situation, that's all fine and dandy, but ideally you're not going to have gasoline in your oil, although that does happen. The point is that this is, this is an environment where it's going to definitely be exposed to gas. So regular RTV blue types of sealants are definitely a no-no in my opinion. Um, there are some people who actually think that like any old sealant will work in this situation. The, if you go online and you look at what a lot of guys use, one of the popular choices is called, I think it's called Honda Seal. And it's a special sealant that is sold by motorcycle places because I, I'm, I'm willing to bet it's actually used for sealing crankcase halves when you split a crankcase. And I think that one of the reasons why it's used is because on two-stroke motorcycles. I may be wrong, but anyways. Then there's also Yamaha, I think, has a version. And uh, long story short, what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a product that I have called... This is made by Hercules. This is called... Um, it's for sealing threads and gaskets. And it's... Uh, it's called Brush On Blue Block. And the reason why I want to use this product over all of the other products that I have is because this is the only product I have that actually stipulates right on the back here. Um, I'll tell you exactly what it says. It says, for flanges and gaskets, apply to mating surfaces, let set for five minutes, and then assemble. Um, blah, 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 blah. A brushable sealant to use on thread connections, flanges, gaskets, and bolts. Sets up quickly to form a tough, flexible seal. Won't harden, crack, crumble, or shrink. Used for water, steam, oil, gases, gasoline, and more. All right. Now, it does say not for gasohol and oxygen. Now, oxygen, obviously, they're talking about the gas, oxygen. Um... Gasohol, that bothers me a little bit because my, my, my thinking is I wonder whether or not they're basically giving you a heads up and saying that, hey, you know what, gasoline with an E10 ethanol additive is going to degrade this product. So that's the only thing I'm a little worried about. But I'm going to roll with it and see what happens. All right, here's what it looks like after I finish getting it all on there. And now I'm just going to give it uh, about four more minutes to tack up. And then I'll get it in, I'll get it all installed. And I guess I'll take this opportunity to see if I can't. Well, should have rotated this crank so it was out of the way a little more. I got some goo on the crank. 
Probably not the optimal situation. There we go. Should be able to wipe it off. There we get that crap off of there. And I did use um I used, I did use some solvent to clean the mating surfaces before I applied this stuff. That ought to do it. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the bolts in to draw it all together tight and then I'll take the bolts back out and mount it in the uh, housing. That's funny, back a couple episodes when I was taking these bolts out, I commented about how I thought that there was some kind of a locking compound on the threads because I saw this red stuff. Well, in reality, all that is is that's the, uh, that's the silicone that was on here. I just realized that these bolts are so long that there's no way I'm going to be able to drive these all the way home and get them to seat this up unless I put some spaces on there. Okay, the SD card filled up right when I was in the middle of uh, reassembly, so I didn't want to stop, but I did manage to get it all together, and it actually looks pretty good. Uh, the sealant squeezed out a little bit. That's okay, though. Um, pretty confident that I've got the bolts fully seated because the distance that they're sticking out above the edge here is, is even. That's looking pretty good. So I'm thinking I'm going to work on... Well, let's see. I'm trying to remember where that... Oh yeah, okay, this must be right here where that connection, one of those connections was that I uh, broke off inadvertently. <laughs> All right, so here's the little grounding wire jumper that I ended up breaking the eyelet off of. And I saved it so that I could make up a new one the same exact length. The funny thing about this wire is that it's a grounding jumper, and it goes from here on the engine over to underneath this screw that holds the ignition coil onto the plastic housing. What I don't understand is what this purpose of this is because this eyelet has a wire already attached to it right here that does the same exact job. So these two, it's a redundant grounding wire is what it is. I don't know why. Um, I even went and looked in the parts manual and it sure as heck looks like that's exactly where it's supposed to go. So uh, if anybody happens to know why they would have two wires doing the same exact job in here, um, I'd love to know. <laughs> 